Good morning, church. I'm Carol. I'm one of the pastors. Didn't Jim do a good job doing what I normally do? <laughs> I'm really excited to come to y'all today because I get to talk to you about Moses, the part of the story. I love Moses. You need to understand how much I love Moses. Here's Moses. <laughs> Moses is my dog. <laughs> <laughs> he got his name in an interesting way. I got this little puppy. He was a free dog. I should have known right then and there, but he was a free dog. And I went to go pick him up, and I had reserved a little girl dog because this mother and father dog got together and shouldn't have, and there were eight puppies. So I went to go pick out my dog. They'd reserved the girl dog, and while I'm holding this precious little girl dog, this dog hops into my lap, climbs up my chest, and begins to lick my ears. He went home with me. But I didn't have a name for him. What am I going to call this dog? What suits his personality? And so one morning, I went into my bedroom, and there I saw this little tiny precious dog was chomping on my Bible. I didn't know what to do at that point in time. And he looked up at me, continued chewing, wagging that tail like nobody's business. I'm like, he's taking in the word. <laughs> so he needs a biblical name, Moses. So Moses is indeed a very big part of the story, and I love when we get to take the story of the Bible and try to put it together. We have started out over here, the whole story as we've been calling it, and we had creation. God created the earth. He created you and me. Then we had the fall, act two, evil spread throughout the world because of some decisions that were made due to temptation. We had the flood, we had the flood, and we learned that do-overs do not work. Sin had spread throughout the world. Mankind, this family that was supposed to be given to Abraham came along. God said, I want a place for you to belong. Abraham, you are going to start this family. And we messed that up. We have these cycles where we're given gifts and we make decisions and we struggle and we mess it up. We've got a goal that we have been learning, and I want y'all to say this with me. This is Galatians 4 through 5, and this whole story that we've got right here leads to this key verse. And if you would join me and recite with me, but when the time came, God sent his son born of a woman subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. Then the Lord said to him, no for certain, ooh, hold it, I've got you far. Mm -mm. I made two slides and it was condensed to one, so we're good, okay? So let me point out several things right here. What I want you to remember out of this as it relates to Moses are the very beginning words, but when the time came. Everything happens in this whole story at an appointed time. Subject to the law. Remember that phrase. And remember freedom. By freedom. Many of you already know the story of Moses. I know that for a fact because I've taught it a couple times on Wednesday night, and my ladies know that story. Allison on Tuesday morning is talking about Moses in a more 50,000-degree mile view because she's pulling the whole Bible together in a study called Seamless. So I encourage you all, watch for Bible studies. They happen when you need them, and when you can dig deep or even an overview 
you are going to learn something every time because it's the living word. And I say that because even if you have studied Moses, or even if you've never heard of it before, this is a critical point in the history, the redemptive history of us. We are included. So let's take it back a little bit to last week. Jim had gotten us to the point of Abraham. We have a family that has been created. God said, you're going to have a family, and all the people on the earth are going to be blessed by this family. It was a promise. But the family had grown. They took that blessing that they had gotten, be fruitful and multiply, and they had grown. So by Genesis 46, we've got 70 people. We've got effectively Joseph's family with Abraham. And they moved to a place of plenty. And they grew. And they grew. And they grew. And they grew. But we knew based on what Jim told us last week, here's that Genesis 15, 13, we knew about slavery. Then the Lord said to him, know for certain, said to who? This is the Lord is talking to Abram at the time. Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, that's Egypt, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. And we know what God says is true. So this family that's multiplying and multiplying is beginning to make Pharaoh over Egypt extremely nervous. There's too many of them. What if they band together? They might be a threat to Egypt. And so after consultation, Pharaoh says, all right, we got to do something about this. This has to stop. This growth has to stop. And so for every male Israelite child that was born, Pharaoh said, get rid of them. Throw them into the Nile River. We'll stop this growth right now. And into this, Moses was born. Mama had faith. Moses' mama had faith. And for three months, Moses was able to stay in his father's household, this little Hebrew baby. But there came a time, he was approximately three months old, and Mama knew that the time had come. He could no longer be a baby in that family. And so what she made, she constructed a little basket, and she coated this basket with pitch. And I point this word pitch out because the Hebrew word for pitch in this basket was the same word that was used for pitch on the ark that took those eight people through the flood. We have instruments of deliverance. God keeps his promises. And God told Abram, your family is going to be made into a great nation. Moses and the Exodus is the single biggest story in the Old Testament with the biggest object lesson when the Lord teaches. God teaches throughout the Bible. What is God teaching these people then? What God is going to be teaching is that these people are enslaved. They're literal slaves at this point because Pharaoh has put them into hard labor. Not only are the male children being thrown into the Nile, but these people, these Israelites, have been put into hard labor with an overseer. They had to build bricks of straw. They're literally slaves. And they've got to be delivered over and over again. You saw right here they had to be delivered. They've got themselves to where they need to be delivered again. And Moses is going to be constantly 
pointing in the direction of Christ without even knowing who Christ is. This is what is so cool about the Old Testament. I love the Old Testament for this reason because it shows exactly what these people had to do in this progressive revelation of God to get people to Christ. This Exodus story of Moses shapes the whole Bible. It's about liberation from slavery and from oppression and people's struggle to enter freedom. It's about redemption. It's about death to sin. How is this done through Moses? Well, this baby had to be taught this baby, this little Hebrew baby, is rescued by the Pharaoh's daughter. And he is raised as an Egyptian, but as God would have it, his mother, Moses' mother, was able to nurse this adopted baby. So God is allowing Moses to learn the Egyptian skills and to learn through that mother that nurses him about God, the almighty God. He's got the privileges of Egypt, but he also has the history, his Hebrew history of God. Now, the first seven chapters or so of Exodus give a very broad overview of the enslavement of Israel. Exodus, think about it. What is the name of that chapter? Exodus, it means to exit, to leave. It's all about deliverance. It's all about freedom from Pharaoh's oppression. Just as God's promise was to deliver people from this Pharaoh's oppression through Moses, God made that original promise to Abraham, if you recall. God said, I'm going to take this family, you will be blessed, and you will bless all other families. Well, how does this happen? Just as the ark delivered Noah's family of eight, they were rescued. So what does deliverance mean? I mean, you might use that word every day. You might think you know what that means, but let's just take it back to a definition. Deliverance means the state of being saved from something dangerous or unpleasant. Deliverance. Just like with Abraham, Moses had to wait on promises. Abraham had to wait for his son to be born for that family to be a great nation. Moses had to wait for leadership. It wasn't promised to him yet. We had to wait for a burning bush. Have you ever been there? Have you ever felt that you had a promise from God? But maybe God has got to develop you and that situation for the right time. Remember that first, the first phrase in Galatians? at the right time. It wasn't Moses' time yet. He was born for something, just like you and I are born for something, but it might not be the right time yet. We have to wait. But 2 Peter 3.9 tells us the Lord is not slow to keep his promise. And in this particular verse, this promise in the New Testament is for Jesus to come again. But this verse shows us the context, the nature of who God is. God does what he says he's going to do. So let's look at Moses' life a minute. In a very broad overview, scholars develop his life into three periods of 40 years. At 40 years old, Acts 7.30 gives us insight that Moses is 40 years old when he killed an Egyptian. What? 
Remember, Moses was in the Egyptian court, but he's still a Hebrew. We read about it here in Exodus. Moses went out where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, looking this way and that. And you know when you got to look this way and that, this is not good. You're going to hide something. And seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and he hid him in the sand. Acts 7.25 tells us that Moses thought at that point in time that his own people would realize that God was going to use him to rescue them. But they did not. Moses wasn't called yet. He had to run away because Pharaoh wanted to kill him. At this point, all bets were lost. This Hebrew, he's adopted, but he's a Hebrew, and he killed an Egyptian. So he was on the run for his life at 40 years old. During this time, Moses met his wife, Zipporah. He had two sons. He got to meet Jethro, his father-in-law, who basically taught him management skills. He was a shepherd, and he learned skills that he was going to need to lead the people of Israel. Then, in those wilderness years, he got the actual call from the burning bush. In Exodus 3, 4, we hear that God called him through that burning bush because God was ready now for an 80-year-old Moses. He had spent 40 wilderness years learning basic skills. But God tells him, okay, you got to go back to Egypt and get my people. I've heard their calls. They are oppressed. All the people that wanted to kill you, Moses, are dead. Now go free my people from oppression. Do you know that the Exodus is mentioned over 120 times in the Old Testament? It is the most frequently mentioned event in the Old Testament. And when God repeats scripture, he wants you to pay attention. During those 40 years, God taught for an additional 40 years that the Hebrew people would need to be led out of Pharaoh's oppression. Passover commemorates the event of leading people, the Hebrew people, out of Israel. Pharaoh needed to be convinced by God by various signs and wonders. And he finally said, you need to take a blood of the blood of a lamb, a perfect unblemished lamb, and you need to put it over your doorstop. And if I see that blood, the angel of death will pass by because the Lord was going to send the angel of death to the oldest son, the oldest person of each household. The blood of the lamb saved people, the Hebrew people, from death. This would be a hugely symbolic event of what Jesus was going to do for all of humanity. God was teaching at that point. This symbolized how death was going to be conquered. The parting of the Red Sea was also a dramatic event of deliverance. The people had gotten away. They'd had the Passover. They left. But they were stuck by the Red Sea. And Pharaoh had changed his mind and he was pursuing the Hebrew people to make them come back because the, the slave labor was gone. But God made a way. God used the miracle of splitting the Red Sea. He delivered them yet again. And sometimes what scholars do is they compare that Red Sea to the act of baptism. It's symbolizing a passage from the bondage, the sinful nature, if you will, to freedom. Where was Moses leading them? To the promised land. 
Moses led the Israelites to the promised land, this place that was to be full of milk and honey, an Old Testament phrase for abundance. This can be seen as the foreshadowing of Jesus leading us to eternal life in the kingdom of God, free from physical bondage. Moses led the Israelites out of a physical bondage. They were slaves in Egypt. God is a liberator. God cares about the struggles of his people day to day. And Jesus also brings us freedom from bondage. However, this generation that Moses was leading did not trust God. Remember, Jim was teaching us about the relationship between Abraham and God, where you have to learn, just like in any relationship, to trust. And Moses had led his people to the very edge of crossing over to the promised land, but the people were scared and they refused to go. And so God said, well, since you don't trust me, I sentence you to wandering that wilderness, a journey where the people could have gotten to the promised land and what scholars estimate to be seven to 10 days turned into 40 years. The Israelites got 40 years of wilderness just like what Moses had. They wandered for 40 years. But God was still teaching in that time too. What's your wilderness? Sometimes you don't know you're enslaved. Take your phone, for example. How attached are you to your phone? My attention span has shortened. To sit there and watch a movie without picking up my phone and scrolling is a challenge sometimes. Or something like an addiction, drinking. Oh, I can stop anytime I want to. There are times that you simply don't know that you're in bondage. Or you can be in bondage and you don't care. There's bondage that you're in, but you are comfortable with it. You can see freedom on the other side. But you don't want to go there. You don't want to go back there to your Egypt. Like smoking, maybe. I know smoking's not good for me, but you know what? It makes me less nervous, and I'm skinny. Our junk food. You know junk food's not good for you. It makes you feel bad, ultimately. And when you're eating it, isn't it good? I like cake. You're trapped. You're enslaved. You're in bondage. The Israelites were oppressed by the Egyptians. We are enslaved by sin. But if we have faith or trust in Jesus Christ, we have the power of God. We have to face our sin. We have to be obedient, even when it's scary sometimes. We have to trust because God has the power to deliver us from sin. But for the Israelites, they had to learn what sin was. So God had to teach the difference between right and wrong. These were an enslaved people. So how are you supposed to act in God's kingdom? And God gave them his law as a standard. Moses received the law in Mount Sinai. And it provided guidance for the Israelites and this should be a response to redemption. What does redemption mean? Redemption is a church word that means buyback. God redeemed the Israelites. God bought them back. God bought the slaves back. So the law is supposed to be a response to redemption. You bought me back, God. I love you so much. I want to do what you want me to do. It was never intended to be a burden. But it was intended for God's teaching to realize that there is an even fuller plan. Not only were the Israelites supposed to get God, 
But we were supposed to get God too. This was never intended to be exclusive. It was for all a universal plan. So there in the Old Testament was the ultimate realization of the universal plan. A plan that will only come to fruition with the coming of Christ. Deliverance and liberation. Moses played a pivotal role in leading the Israelites out of slavery from Egypt, symbolizing deliverance from bondage. Jesus is the ultimate deliverer. Moses was chosen by God to be a deliverer. But Jesus will be sent to free all of humanity from the bondage of sin enslavement. Moses mediated the law, but Jesus brings grace. Because to get freedom, you can't earn it. You can't earn it through works. You can't earn it by being the best there is at keeping that law, because you know what? Nobody could keep that law. No one could keep that law but Jesus and he freely gives freedom to those who believe in what he's done. So the oral tradition of this deliverance story is passed down. You see it recited over and over and over again in the scriptures. God will deliver on his promises. We have to be willing to face our sin in one way or another. But we've ultimately been delivered from the consequences of that sin in the work of Jesus Christ. So all of Moses' actions point to Jesus Christ. God spoke to them. He spoke to them in Exodus at the giving of the law, and he said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Exodus is the single redemptive turning point in the people's history from Israel, and they strayed. By Deuteronomy 31 and 32, God is talking to Moses, and he's like, these people are going to fail. These people are going to fail, they're going to rebel, but he offers hope. God offers hope in the fact that he keeps his promises. So Moses was the deliverer of the law, but it pointed directly to Jesus. This is a huge connection point through the whole of the Bible. It goes beyond the ark. It goes beyond a baby's basket. It saves a nation, a rebellious nation. Think of it in your daily life. Jesus Christ affects your exodus, your exodus from sin, your exodus from slavery, and he's taking us to the promised land. Moses was human. He couldn't do it all on his own. He was one of those instruments of deliverance. He was led by God. But Jesus fulfilled that law that was given to Moses. The covenant of Moses was temporary. It could not save. And if the goal, as Jim pointed out last week, was to defeat death, Moses couldn't do it. The new covenant in salvation for all who trust in Christ the new covenant is established on better promises. That word salvation, it's another churchy word. What's salvation? If somebody's saved, they have salvation. But in my opinion, you've got to be able to use the word to somebody who doesn't know a churchy word, so I looked it up. Salvation means, guess what? The deliverance from sin and its consequences. 
Jesus is the one worthy of greater honor than Moses because he could get it done and he's coming back. So the whole story of slavery is a picture of the struggles that we live today. Difficulty, suffering, getting rescued, being taken to a place of safety. It's from Exodus, Genesis, it goes backwards, it goes forward through the Gospels to Revelation. Exodus is a paradigm for salvation. It represents Israel's delivery from sin and slavery and death as well as salvation from sin and death in Christ. Think about that. Pray with me. Dear Lord in heaven, you use object lessons to teach. May we not miss the object lessons that you give us let us not take for granted that everything was done in the Old Testament and that we have Jesus now. Don't let us dumb it down, Lord. Let us know the cost that you paid. Just as that song was that we sang earlier, Jesus paid it all, all for you and me. And we are part of this story, Lord. We are part of the object lesson. Help us, Lord, to remember that everything you say is true and you will deliver on your promises. In your precious name we pray. Amen.